Welcome to Lecture 17. In this lecture, we're going to explore components of California's agroecosystem. I have a unique perspective on this because I grew up actually farming some tomatoes. So we'll talk about that and some other important crops in California. Remember, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to meet with you in a Zoom office hours. Thanks, and let's get started. In our previous lecture, we talked about the history and origins of agriculture. In this lecture, we'll talk about California's agroecosystem, and then we'll move on to biotechnology. One of the questions I left off with in the last lecture was this question of how to feed the world. And I would argue that addressing the building global food crisis will require scientific innovation, especially in plant biology. You can see on the left here that the world's population is growing very rapidly, especially in the least developed countries where technology, especially in plant biology, may be in short supply. And the WHO has identified eradicating extreme poverty and hunger as its primary goal. While this lecture is focused on California, it's important to recognize California's place in the global agricultural economy. California is an important exporter of many different food crops to places all around the world. In order to start talking about California's agroecosystem, we need to first get a sense of its geography. We'll start with the Central Valley. If you look at agriculture broadly in the U.S., you'll see that California represents 11% of total U.S. production, both in crops and livestock. If you look at this map of our country, you can see that each dot represents about $20 million in agricultural business. And you can see that in California, we have a great density of dots in most areas of the state. If you look at a map of where we send our agricultural products, you can see that the United States has a global reach. Of course, places like Mexico and Canada figure prominently, but also places like China. When you think of agriculture in California, the place that most comes to mind is the Central Valley. And this is an elongated valley that's in between two important mountain ranges. These are the Sierra Nevada mountain ranges in the east, and then a series of ranges that's referred to as the coast ranges on the west. So in between all of this, you have a extremely fertile but geologically distinct area where most of California's agriculture is focused. It's 430 miles long and 75 miles wide. A good question might be, why is California's agriculture so focused in the Central Valley? And one reason is its geology. The Central Valley is essentially filled with alluvial deposits that were washed out of the mountains over the past five million years. And in most areas, the soils are very deep. And so if you look on the far left, you can see that this rough soil map of California shows that the Central Valley is filled with old alluvium. This is old washed down soil that was washed out from the mountain ranges over the past five million years. If you look at the middle map, you can get an idea of the depth of the soils. And so you can see that the Central Valley has a rich depth of soil. And then of course on the far right, it's important to realize that just because the Central Valley is filled with this old alluvium doesn't mean that the soil is consistent across the valley. In fact, there are many places that have some differences that make it more or less suitable to certain kinds of agricultural crops. As we talked about previously, California's climate is referred to as a Mediterranean climate. This means we have cool, wet winters and hot, dry summers. But within our state, we have a lot of variation. In the Sacramento Valley, average annual precipitation is moderate, but in the San Joaquin part of the valley, it approaches desert-like conditions in some areas. So where we are in Davis, in the northern part of the valley, we get a lot more rain than in the southern part of the valley. And if you look at the map on the far left, you can see the range in precipitation that's experienced in the valley. And that's important because that precipitation largely defines what crops can grow in those areas. Now on the far right, 
It's also important to understand that drought has had a severe impact, especially when you think about the management of agriculture, which we'll talk about at the very end of the lecture. But you can see on the map that some areas in California have experienced severe and extreme drought in recent years. If we think back to the climate of the Central Valley, especially to precipitation, it's almost like you can divide the Central Valley into two parts. And in fact, that's what most people do. That's how we think about it. We think about it as the northern part, which is referred to as the Sacramento Valley because it is defined by the Sacramento River. And that has a wetter climate compared to the San Joaquin Valley. Here we tend to grow things like rice, almonds, walnuts, and tomatoes especially. The southern part of the valley is referred to as the San Joaquin Valley because it is defined by the San Joaquin River. This has a much drier climate in comparison to the Sacramento Valley with dense fog in winter. It's most famous for grapes. This includes both table grapes and raisins, but also many other important crops. One important area near us is the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. This is the area where you have the confluence of the San Joaquin and Sacramento rivers. Historically, this is really important as a wetlands. So if you look on the far right, you can see that pre-development, it was more marshy with lots of tule grass species. You had some peat soils um, with a pretty high water table. Now, post-development, what's been happening is the raising and building of levees and the pumping of water out of the delta. Now, this produced lots of really good agricultural land, but does come at the cost of environmental impact in those areas. On the left, you can see the confluence of the Sacramento River and the San Joaquin River, which define that Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta region. One of the things that I like about this old map is that it shows the diversity of agricultural products, including livestock, produced in the United States. And if you look at California, even historically, it was recognized as a region that had a great diversity of agricultural products. It was never really a place where you had lots and lots and lots of livestock, but definitely a wealth of different agricultural products. A more modern view of this shows that in contrast to other agricultural areas in our country, California grows more than 230 different crops. And some of those we produce the vast majority of for the whole country. So for example, we produce 99% of all almonds, walnuts, 98% of pistachios, 95% of broccoli. We produce lots of strawberries, grapes, tomatoes, and of course, lettuce. So it's not only that California produces a wealth of different food crops, it's that some of those food crops are almost entirely grown in California. Given the diversity of agriculture in California, it should come as no surprise that it's really important state economically in the United States. And so agriculture in California generates about $47 billion each year. And in California, it's still the true that grapes are the most important industry with $5.2 billion in grapes every single year. But almonds are closely approaching that and my expectation is that they will take over as the most economically important crop in the coming years. When we indicate that grapes are the most economically important agricultural product in California, most people probably think about wine grapes. And indeed, California is really famous for its wine grapes. But historically, it's actually been table and raisin grapes that are most important. Now, those are in sharp decline over recent years, and wine grapes are quickly accelerating. And we have some of the most famous wine regions in the whole world with varying types of soils and climate conditions that make them amenable to certain kinds of grape varieties. One thing you may not realize is that California's wine industry almost was destroyed in the 80s and 90s by a pest called grape phylloxera. You can see grape phylloxera on the far right, 
And what happened was these pests invaded wineries and ended up killing many of these vines. And so the solution to this ended up being something called grafting. Now grafting is not unique to wine grapes and it's used in lots of other different um, agricultural products, uh, most notably things like fruit trees. And this is where you take rootstock that is resistant to a particular pest and you graft it onto a plant, a top part of the plant that is different than the rootstock. Right, so what happens is you kind of get these two different plants, one of which might be a specialized grape variety like Cabernet Sauvignon, but it's grown on rootstock that is resistant to something like phylloxera. And again, this is used as a tool to not only combat um, different kinds of pests and infections, but also to keep the sizes of some plants small. So there are many examples of things like dwarf fruit trees where the top part of the fruit tree is pretty normal, but it's a lot shorter overall because it's grafted to a stock that is a lot shorter. Perhaps the most remarkable trend in California over the past 10 years or so is the rapid increase in almonds. Between 2005 and 2015, almond acreage has increased by 81%. So California is essentially the only place in the U.S. where almonds are grown. Now, there are consequences to this, one of which is that almonds, while they do very well in California, are also very thirsty. So they take a lot of water. And with the rapid increase in the amount of uh, almonds that have been planted, it's led to some conflicts and controversy, especially in the Central Valley, over water and water rights. Now, um, there's a general rule of thumb that it takes about one gallon of water to produce one almond. And if you drive up and down Interstate 5, you can see how many almond trees there are and get a little bit better idea of the scale of the water issues that we're facing in our state. To put this another way, almonds are among the most water intensive crops grown in California. And recent studies are really trying to come to terms with this and analyze this in a quantitative way. And so on the far left, you can see a graph where on the X axis, you have water footprint rank, where higher numbers mean a larger footprint. And then on the y-axis, you can see average nutrient rank, where the lower the number is, the more nutrients are present. And you can see that while almonds are at the very tippy top in terms of water footprint, they're also at the tippy top of nutrients. So while they do use a lot of water, they are also a very nutrient-rich food. To look at this yet another way, on the far right, you can see another graph where on the x-axis, you have the total water footprint, and on the y-axis, you have the total farm cells. And so you can see that almonds are a clear outlier with a huge water footprint relative to other crops, but also a huge amount of sales. So as I said before, they are quickly becoming California's most economically important crop. The next crop we'll talk about are strawberries, and strawberries are grown along the coast, especially in Southern California, and all the plants are propagated by cloning. So this means that the plants are not grown from seed, they are grown from transplants, and thus have really limited genetic diversity. This makes them highly susceptible to diseases and pests. So much so that when a strawberry field is gonna be planted, they spray intensively before they even go in and plant the strawberry plants. So if it's me, one of the things I always look for are the good organic strawberries because I know that strawberries that are conventionally and commercially grown are exposed to lots and lots and lots of pesticides. And you can read more about that in the links that I've provided on this slide. Another important California food crop we'll talk about is lettuce. 
About 75% of the lettuce and leafy greens consumed in the U.S. come from California. So what you get is a shift between lettuce that's grown in spring and summer in California, and then in fall, it's mostly grown in Arizona. In California, there's a number of different important lettuce growing regions, but probably the most important is the Salinas Valley along the central coast. One of the lettuces that's important to both California and Arizona is romaine lettuce. Romaine lettuce is really popular, but also somewhat maligned because it's frequently linked to outbreaks of E. coli. E. coli is a bacterium that causes lots of gastrointestinal distress and has actually ended up killing some people in extreme cases. The E. coli is frequently tracked back to contaminated water supplies that are then used to irrigate fields of romaine lettuce. And so what frequently happens is feedlots and dairies end up having cattle that are a little bit too close to the main irrigation ditches that transport water that is then used to irrigate these fields. And so rounds of frequent testing have been proposed and are starting to be implemented, especially in these areas, to prevent these outbreaks. In some places in Yellow County, you can find walnuts and almonds growing side by side, but there's some important differences. First, unlike almonds, walnut trees take about five to seven years to start producing. And California produces 99% of all U.S. walnuts in just five different counties. So if you look on the far left, you can see a map of California where Butte, Sutter, San Joaquin, Stanislaus, and Tulare counties are the five most important counties for growing walnuts. UC Davis has a long history with walnuts, first with the Chandler walnut, which was invented on campus and named after Professor W.H. Chandler. But more recently, it's been involved in genetic work with walnuts, and in 2015, UC Davis was the first place to sequence and crack, quote unquote, the whole walnut genome, Tomatoes are important all across California and can be broken up into two categories. The first is processing tomatoes, which are the tomatoes that are oftentimes used in sauces, things like ketchup. And the second are fresh market tomatoes. These are the ones that you usually buy in stores and put on sandwiches. Now, tomatoes are grown across California, but they're really concentrated in just nine counties. If you look at the graph on the left, you can see that the two most important counties are Fresno and Yolo. And Yolo County is important to us because that's where UC Davis is located. So 35,000 contracted acres of tomatoes are grown in Yolo County each year. As I mentioned at the start of the lecture, tomatoes have been really important in my life, mostly because my father has been working in tomatoes for over 40 years. And I started working in tomato fields at a pretty young age, and I've pretty much done all of the different jobs in tomatoes. And so I've done things like planting, which is what you see people doing here in the very middle. I've actually done uh, irrigating of tomatoes uh, using pipes where you like sort of use suction to pull water out of irrigation ditches and get down the furrows to water the plants. I've done picking, where I've picked tomato plants and filled up buckets and brought them to be filled in gondolas, which you see here, and here are the pictures of the gondolas. Now, one thing you may not realize is that a lot of the fresh market tomatoes that are actually picked, what happens is they're picked green. And so you can see here that this worker is dumping a bucket of tomatoes into a gondola and they don't look at all ripe. And that's because if they were ripe, of course, they'd get all crushed and damaged and nobody would want to buy them. So then what happens is these tomatoes are brought to a processing plant where ethylene gas is used to artificially ripen the tomatoes. And so this produces a tomato that is really good for cutting on sandwiches, it's easy to work with, but in my experience, is not all that flavorful. And so you have to kind of pay a premium for tomatoes that are a lot more freshly picked when they're ripe. And of course they get to you and they taste a lot richer, but you can tell they're a lot softer and a lot more hard to work with. Among the nut trees that we've talked about, pistachios are easily the most difficult. 
And this is partly because they take the longest time to mature. So it's about six to 10 years with lots of pruning and gentle care of the tree as it gets to that age. And then it's pretty expensive harvest techniques. And so what happens with pistachios uh, is similar to other um, nut trees where a shaker comes underneath the tree and gently shakes all the nuts off the tree. But when pistachios are first harvested, they have a soft outer layer that surrounds them. And so when you first see them, even when they're ready to be eaten, they're actually sort of look like grapes on the tree. And then when they get taken away, they take it, get taken to a processor, which has a bunch of machines that remove that outer husk. And then those nuts are then roasted or dried. And so Pistachios fetch a premium price in part because of how long they take to mature, but also their expensive harvesting um, techniques. Now, uh, something that's been happening in California is as climate's been shifting, what's been happening is the trees end up producing blanks. So they end up producing um, fruit that don't have any nuts on the inside. And this is partly because of um, drought, but also of temperatures, where if the temperature is not just right, the fruit doesn't end up setting. And so um, this is another reason why pistachios can be a lot more expensive than something like walnuts or almonds. Given that we've talked about a lot of different crops that are water intensive in California, I think it's important to end this lecture by talking a little bit about water as it relates to agriculture. The key to understanding water in California is to learn about the California Aqueduct Project. And so this is something that actually starts in that area we talked about earlier, which is the San Joaquin River Delta. So if you look on the far left, there's a map of California and outlined in red is the San Joaquin River Delta. So think back, this is the point where you have the confluence of the Sacramento River and the San Joaquin River where they ultimately meet up and then that water drains out into the ocean in uh, San Francisco Bay. Now the important thing to understand is that there's a series of, can of canals that essentially collects water from the San Joaquin River Delta area and transports it south through our state. So a lot of places, especially important cities like Los Angeles, for example, rely on fresh water that is collected in the San Joaquin River Delta. Also places like San Jose, which wouldn't even be there if it didn't rely on this or didn't have access to this water that comes from the San Joaquin River Delta. And so what happens is the water, as it makes its way down south, ends up being used for a variety of agricultural projects. Now, what happens is, is that the farmers that have farms near the uh, canals have rights to extract certain amounts of water each year. And some of those rights are historical and long-standing. And so some farmers actually don't have any rights to that water, and some farmers do. So there's this balance depending on how old or when that farmland was originally purchased. To look at this another way, on the far left, you can see that there's, here's an image where it shows a picture of a portion of the San Joaquin River Delta. And you can see there's a really complicated series of water flow that happens here. And it's important to understand that a lot of the small islands that you see here, they're all artificial. So ordinarily, those islands would be partially submerged or even maybe even a little bit mixed with seawater that flows back um, towards in, in the fracture water and the reason why you have these islands is because um, there were a whole bunch of levees built and then that water was pumped away and that's created a lot of really important agricultural land of course that is uh, prime for growing certain kinds of crops in California so the people that live there desperately want to protect those areas. And on the far right, there's a picture of the Delta Mendota Canal, which you can see along Interstate 5. And that's one of the canals that is used to transport water from the Delta 
all the way south. And this is one of the canals that's actually used um, by farmers that have farms, you know, near the near the um, canal to pump water out and use for irrigation. But it's important to understand that the, the water rights are really controversial in this area. It's not like everybody gets access to this water. To compound this even further, because the water is pumped out of this area, these rivers and connections that you can see like in this photo here are really important for certain fish species. So some fish species, things like the Delta smelt, for example, which are endangered fish, um, are endangered partly because of declining water quality and um, the excessive pumping of this water. And so um, what has happened in recent periods is the governor has restricted the pumping of this water to protect those fish species. And so this legislation works to protect the fish species, but at the cost of the farmers that are, live in that area not being able to get the water to water their fields. And so there's a lot of controversy surrounding this. Um, there's even, of course, the tunnel project, which is proposed to dig massive tunnels that go essentially underneath the San Joaquin River Delta to provide water a little bit more directly to Southern California. And there's a huge um, a number of groups that are strongly opposed to this, not the least of which are the farmers and environmental organizations. And so as California has entered historic drought, and because water uh, pumping out of the aqueduct has been restricted, what has happened is many farmers in the Central Valley have turned to digging private wells on their property to directly access the groundwater. And so what's been happening is every small farm that doesn't have access to this freshwater ends up drilling very deep wells to access the groundwater, which they then use to irrigate their fields. And so what you've seen as a consequence of this is dramatic drops in the level of groundwater storage that uh, have gone, you know, from, you know, especially in recent times, absolutely plummeted because of these private well drillings, which until recently were entirely unregulated. And so the groundwater that is there actually relies on recharge. So what that means is there's got to be precipitation and of course flow from the rivers in order to recharge the groundwater. But because of the drought, that groundwater was not getting recharged despite the fact that more people are pulling water from the ground to use to irrigate their crops. These recharge rates really depend on lots of different factors, not the least of which is the soil composition and chemistry. So some areas um, have better recharge than others, but a lot of the areas that are most impacted, you can see on the far left here, the very poor and poor areas happen to be areas which are really important agriculturally in our state. And in 2014, there has been a law signed by Jerry uh, Brown called the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which is aims to manage the drilling of these private wells. In this lecture, we talked about California's agroecosystem. I showed you some of the geological reasons why California's valleys are so special, and then went on to discuss some important California crops and issues surrounding California agriculture. Remember, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to meet with you in a Zoom office hours. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.